Greetings, Indian colleagues. I'm honored to be invited to participate in your meeting today. And I thank the organizers for inviting me. I hope that we will be able to continue our discussions in person at some time in the not too distant future. This talk presentation is a brief update on what we know about pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma in 2022. At the end of the lecture, the participants will be able to explain the development of normal paraganglia and corresponding nomenclature, recent changes in the WHO classification of pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, the clinical implications of hereditary pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, and the evolving roles of pathology and biomarkers in diagnosis and patient care. Our nomenclature for pheochromocytoma and paraganglia was originally described by the chromaffin reaction. In the mid-19th century, researchers in a variety of countries were using rather primitive histochemical techniques in order to determine what substances were produced in different cells. It was found that if you fix a piece of adrenal medulla in some ordinary fixative, not very much will happen. However, when the same tissue is fixed in a solution of chromate salts, a dark reddish brown color develops. It was believed that this color change resulted from a specific affinity for chromium, hence the term chromaffin cell and chromaffin reaction were coined by an anatomist named Alfred Cohen, who was working extensively on these cells in Prague at the time. However, it was subsequently discovered that if you take the same piece of tissue and you fix it in a solution of a weak oxidizing agent, such as iodate, you'll get a similar, though not identical, color change. It was discovered much later on that the color change resulted not from affinity for chromium, but from oxidation of stored substances, which we now know are catecholamines. Consequently, the term pheochromocyte was invented to describe the color change without connoting a mechanism for it. However, by that time, the term chromaffin cell and chromaffin reaction had firmly taken hold for the normal tissue, while pheochromocyte was later adopted for its neoplastic counterpart. Consequently, we start with the peculiar situation in which a normal cell type goes by one name and its neoplastic counterpart goes by another. Alfred Cohen, the researcher who was working on chromaffin cells and the chromaffin reaction, came up with a revolutionary concept as a result of his work. He said, since the chromaffin tissue complexes form ganglion-like bodies, since their elements are derived from ganglion precursors, since they are connected to the sympathetic nervous system and still are not genuine ganglia, I have called them paraganglia. So the concept and the term of paraganglia are based not on proximity, but on analogy to sympathetic ganglia. And this concept was revolutionary because it was the first iter iteration, first conceptualization of a diffuse neuroendocrine system, in this case, a nervous system-derived diffuse neuroendocrine system rather than, ep than an epithelial one that preceded that notion by approximately 50 years. Cohen and his colleagues and others used the chromaffin reaction to map the distribution of chromaffin cells throughout the body, and they soon discovered that small groups of chromaffin cells were distributed throughout the distribution of the peripheral sympathetic nervous system of stem to stern and the distribution of nerves from, from the superior cervical ganglion all the way to 
uh, nerves innervating the the pelvic and abdominal organs. And these were all microscopic except for the adrenal medulla in adults and the organ or organs of Zucker candle, which are a large body of or bodies of chromaffin like cells at roughly the origin of the inferior mesenteric artery. Similar cells were located along branches of the vagus and glossopharyngeal nerves in the head and neck. Again, these were microscopic and highly variable in location, except for the carotid body, which is macroscopic and is consistently located at the bifurcation of the carotid artery. Cells along the sympathetic nervous system are now known as sympathetic or sympathoadrenal paraganglia. And those in the head and neck are known as parasympathetic or head and neck paraganglia. An alternate term for these that was applied some time ago but is now obsolete was non chromaffin paraganglia. This term is obsolete because the chromaffin reaction itself is obsolete, and there are much better ways of, of, of de detecting and identifying paraganglionic tissue. Between World War I and World War II, there was a long hiatus in the study of chromaffin cell biology. And this field remained essentially dormant until the 1950s when it was reawakened by an anatomist in England named Rex Copeland. Copeland published many papers but he summarized them in a classic book called The Natural History of the Chromaffin Cell, which he published in 1965. And Copeland mapped the distribution of chromaffin cells throughout the body as Alfred Cohn had done. And he next mapped the distribution of tumors of chromaffin cells that had been reported up to that time. And he found that this distribution pretty precisely correlated with the distribution of, nor of normal chromaffin tissue, establishing the distribution of pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas that we know to this day. And he also reported that these tumors were located, and their normal counterparts were pretty much located or concentrated in the vicinity of nerves derived from the, uh, the pre-aortic uh, plexuses, particularly the celiac and hypogastric plexuses, and the, those near the inferior mesenteric artery. This beautiful drawing of those plexuses here is not from Copeland himself, but is an illustration from the 1918 edition of Gray's Anatomy. Moving on to embryology, there have been profound changes in the understanding of the development of, of paraganglia and the adrenal medulla since Cohn's time. From the 1970s to roughly through the 1990s, we had the concept of a pluripotent primitive sympathetic cell that delaminated from the neural crest and migrated either to the adrenal medulla and extra adrenal paraganglia or to sympathetic ganglia with its ultimate fate depending upon the environment in which it came to rest. This theory had begun to be overturned by the mid-1980s but it was finally put to rest uh, in the 1990s and was completely modified as a result of a paper by Furlan et al. in Science in 2017. And the current understanding resulting from that paper and those that followed it is that the fates of cells derived from the neural crest are largely predetermined and there are distinct populations of progenitors for neurons and chromaffin cells 
characterized by distinct markers and distinct routes of migration. There are some crossovers expressing bridge cell markers, especially in humans, and some of these bridge cell markers are, are illustrated here. And there are newly recognized progenitors called Schwann cell precursors that may constitute the majority of, of, of cells contributing to the development of the paraganglionic system. As described in these illustrations from the Furland paper, there is indeed a population of neural crest cells that delaminates directly from the neural crest and makes a beeline for the sympathetic ganglia. However, a perhaps much larger population <clears throat> remains in situ in the vicinity of the developing sensory ganglia. Cells mature in the, in, the, in the sensory ganglia, that is the dorsal root ganglia, that subsequently form from the neural crest in that location, and migrate along sensory neurons to join up with preganglionic sympathetic neurons, emerge, uh, sympathetic axons that emerge from the intermediolateral columns of the spinal cord. And they use those axons as guidance to reach their destinations in the adrenal medulla and paraganglia, with the exception of a few bridge cells, crossover cells that I mentioned. These cells have been that that arise from the dorsal root ganglia and, per, and have a reservoir within the sensory ganglia and sensory axons have been given the unfor, perhaps unfortunate name of Schwann cell precursors because they give rise, unfortunate because they give rise to a variety of derivatives uh, other than Schwann cells. But the importance of this concept is that Schwann cell precursors migrate in waves and they eventually require ac this axonal guidance because the embryo becomes too large and too complicated with too many obstacles for directly migrating cells to reach their destinations. And the clinical importance or potential clinical importance of Schwann cell precursors, which is they, they serve as a potential reservoir of neural crest cells after the neural crest ceases to exist. And in that capacity serve a uh, function for expansion and diversification of the cell populations in neural crest derived tissues. The different paths of migration and different waves of migration of, of Schwann cell progenitors may explain a number of previously unexplained phenomena, including different types of skin pigmentation and different characteristics of the of neuroblastomas as well as paragangliomas that arise in different locations. This is a transverse section of an approximately 19 week human fetus showing what paraganglia really look like. And as a cross section, these two structures, which are paraganglia here, <clears throat> may correspond to what is diagrammed as the lobes of the organ of Zuckert candle. They typically are composed of clear cells. You can see this, the classic cell bond architecture here. And also note that these paraganglia are very close to retroperitoneal lymph nodes. And this explains why you cannot use imaging to tell whether a primary tumor, whether a paraganglioma in any of these locations is is primary or a lymph node metastasis. So the only sites of metastasis that are unequivocal are sites in which normal paraganglia do not occur, which are bone and histologically histologically documented uh, lymph, lymph node. Normal paraganglia, as well as their neoplastic counterparts, express well-known markers that we're all familiar with, including chromogranin A, tyrosine, and tyrosine hydroxylase. Uh, the sustentacular cells, 
which retain many of the properties of Schwann cell precursors, although they may not be precursors of anything in the adult, uh, ex express S100 and SOX10 and can be identified using those markers. <coughs> Tyrosine hydroxylase and chromogranate A may often not be expressed in head and neck paraganglia or paragangliomas, and other, other markers may be needed to identify them, as I'll discuss later. This is a higher magnification and another view of a, of a human fetus, and this slide is shown to make several points. First, this is the adrenal medulla, and these are the extra adrenal paraganglia. Note that extra adrenal paraganglia are fully formed before the adrenal medulla exists. These pink cells here are provisional cortex or fetal cortex, which are just starting to be populated by these adrenal medullary precursors. Extra adrenal paraganglia are the main source of fetal catecholamines. And they respond directly to hypoxia in order to regulate fetal heart rate before central mechanisms of hypoxic signaling are established. And in that role, they express a number of transcription factors called hypoxia-inducible transcription factors, one of which is known as HIF2-alpha or EPAS1, which plays a particularly important role in the development of a family of paraganglionic tumors. The organ of Zucca candle, which has a catchy name, is the largest single collection of fetal chromaffin tissue, but it should remember that be remembered that it still comprises less than one half of the total, according to Rex, to Rex Copeland. The conventional wisdom about paraganglia for many years had been that they involute in adult life or by adult life, but that in fact is not entirely correct. The organ of Zucker candle may involute, but microscopic paraganglia often persist. For example, this one, characterized by the typical clear cell populations and cell ball and in the wall of the gallbladder, and here it is in an adult, and here it is stained for chromogranin A. And these persistent normal paraganglia are potential sites both for the origin of paragangliomas and as diagnostic pitfalls in places where clear cells or clear cell, where clear cell neoplasms may arise. So if you find a paraganglion in the vicinity of the prostate or the kidney and you're looking for a, a, a clear cell carcinoma of the kidney or a prostatic carcinoma, you should not be fooled into mistaking a paraganglion for an implant or, or metastatic focus of carcinoma. The World Health Organization Blue Book in 2004 first codified some arbitrary definitions in order to reduce inconsistent classifications of tumors in and outside of the adrenal medulla that had existed until that time. And the 2004 Blue Book stipulated Pheochromocytomas arise in the adrenal medulla and are derived from chromaffin cells. Extra adrenal paragangliomas arise from chromaffin cells in sympathoadrenal and parasympathetic paraganglia. And as a historical annotation, it added a pheochromocytoma is an intraadrenal sympathetic paraganglioma. Now, although the nomenclature was arbitrary, it does indeed, the special treatment of the adrenal medulla does in fact reflect some distinctive characteristics of intraadrenal tumors. They're often adrenergic, that is they produce adre uh, adrenaline or, or epinephrine, while extraadrenal paragangliomas are almost always noradrenergic, dopaminergic, or non-functional, with the exception of a recently reported group of adrenergic pheochromocytomas in China. 
They also have a lower likelihood of metastasis, and they also have a proclivity to occur in association with particular hereditary disorders. But quite a bit of awkwardness and quite a number of odd abbreviations result from arbitrarily trying to separate entities that we know are overall more similar than they are different. So the terminology, or at least the, the, the concepts that accompany that terminology, have evolved in the 2022 Series 5 Blue Books. The definition now is that a pheochromocytoma is a neuroendocrine neoplasm that originates from chromaffin cells of the adrenal medulla and is an intraadrenal paraganglioma. So the historical nomenclature thing is, is gone. It is, in fact, a reasonable term to think of it as a paraganglioma. And related to acceptable terminology is intraadrenal paraganglioma or adrenal sympathetic paraganglioma. So while the actual separation of terms still persists, pheochromocytoma is not going to go away anytime soon. A better way of organizing our conceptual framework is to consider all of these struct to these tumors as part of the paraganglionic system with their distinctive characteristics determined both by their anatomic locations and by their underlying genetic abnormalities. And this is, in a way, a trip back to the future, because if we look at literature from the early part of the 20th century, the tumors that we now know of, that we now call pheochromocytomas, were in fact described in this example, in this sample reference from 2029, as adrenal paragangliomas in, in, different, in different languages in this particular paper. WHO 2022 continues, as in 2017, the last series of blue books, to discourage the use of the terms benign and malignant for pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. Sympathetic paragangliomas and pheochromocytomas are all coded as malignant. The terms benign pheochromocytoma and malignant pheochromocytoma are not recommended. They're all combined into pheochromocytoma in the new blue book. This brings thinking into line with concepts of gastroenteropancreatic nets, which are all considered to have some risk of metastasis. And this approach encourages risk encourages risk stratification rather than binary classification. The risk of metastasis in pheochromocytoma paraganglioma is affected by tumor location and genotype. Overall, it is still somewhere between 10 and 15 percent, and overall for the adrenal, it's still somewhere around 5 percent, while for extra adrenal sympathetic paragangliomas, the risk is approximately 20%. However, in any location with the succinate dehydrogenase B mutation, succinate dehydrogenase B being one of the genes that encodes subunits of this Krebs cycle enzyme succinate dehydrogenase, the risk for metastasis is over 30%. The prognosis of these tumors is also affected by tumor stage, which is in turn affected by tumor location. And the eighth edition staging manual of the American Joint Cancer Commission introduced a staging system that reflects both tumor, tumor stage and tumor location. So a tumor is classified as T1 if it's less than five centimeters in greatest dimension and has no extra adrenal invasion. It automatically becomes T2 if it's intraadrenal measuring more than five centimeters or is an extra, extra adrenal sympathetic paraganglioma of any size with or without extra adrenal invasion. 
This reflects the greater likelihood of invasion of extra adrenal sympathetic paragangliomas and that sharp dichotomy between adrenal and extra adrenal in terms of survival is shown in this Kaplan-Meier plot. However, if you look again more closely at the, at the data, a great deal of this difference in survival is dependent on the presence or absence of SDHB mutation. Since most extra adrenal paragangliomas are extra adrenal, or abdominal or thoracoabdominal tumors. The staging system does not apply to head and neck paragangliomas because they were generally considered to have a very low metastatic risk. However, had even head and neck paragangliomas harboring SDHB mutations, though they are not staged, probably have a higher risk than those with the more common SDHD mutations. Our understanding of the heredity of pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas has also continued to expand both prior to and with the current Blue Book. Key points to remember are that these tumors are the most hereditarily driven of all human tumors, and at least 30% are now known to have a hereditary basis. Tumor locations, syndromic associations, risk of metastasis and endocrine function all correlate with the predisposing gene. Germline mutations of more than 20 susceptibility genes have so far been reported, and the largest number of familial aggregations of these tumors involve mutations of genes encoding subunit of, subunits of succinate dehydrogenase, which are often sometimes collectively referred to as SDHX genes and SDHX mutations. So if we look at the rate at which new mutations have been discovered, prior to the year 2000, we were very familiar with NF1, VHL, <coughs> and RET as the main causes of hereditary theochromocytoma. Revolutionary uh, papers published by Bora Baisal and Hartmut Neumann, respectively, uh, in 2000 and 2002, identified a whole new class of tumors characterized by succinate dehydrogenase gene mutations, and additional hereditary mutations continue to be discovered from that time to the present. An additional new development is that somatic mutations have come increasingly to the fore. So if we look at the combined frequency of germline and somatic mutations for different types of tumors in 2021, BHL and NF1 and RET are still, are still there and are still common, but somatic mutations of NF1 are even more common than germline mutations and somatic mutations of, of VHL and RET are also, are also uh, not infrequently encountered. Interestingly, somatic mutations of HIF2-alpha, EPAS1, are overwhelmingly predominant, and if any germline mutations actually exist at all, they are, ex they ex are extremely uncommon. And the exact reasons for this difference is not clear. We're very familiar with the genotype-phenotype correlations in classic paraganglioma syndromes. For example, with MEN2B and RET mutations, we have almost exclusively adrenal tumors, and these may be associated by medullary thyroid carcinoma and parathyroid, uh, not uh, hyperplasia or neoplasia. Uh, similarly, in NF1, we have neurofi neurofibromatosis type 1. <clears throat> we have predominantly adrenal tumors, and the associated tumors there are, are GISTs. And in VHL, the associated tumors include renal cell carcinoma.
SDH X mutations create an entire new level of complexity in dealing with these hereditary tumors. As I've mentioned, the great majority of familial groupings of pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma and almost 10% of apparently sporadic tumors are accounted for by these mutations. The SDH mutations also account for almost 30% of pediatric cases and at least 30% of the tumors that metastasize and are present in somewhere between 15 and 25% of all patients with paragangliomas. But extremely importantly, the spectrum of tumor types in patients with SDHX syndromes overlaps the spectra of classic syndromes. So this, this table briefly uh, lists the locations and the types of syndromically associated tumors uh, in, in paraganglioma syndromes associated with mutations of the different SDH genes. And notice that a common finding in several of these is the presence of, of gastrointestinal stromal tumor or renal cell carcinoma. Pituitary uh, neoplasia may also occur in some patients. So we have to be aware of these syndromic overlaps, and we also have to be aware of distinctive characteristics of these syndromically associated tumors that occur in patients with SDH mutations so that we can call attention to the possibility of syndromic disease. So starting with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, the biochemical phenotype of the tumor usually points to tumor location and to genotype. Epinephrine or adrenaline is normally synthesized almost exclusively in the adrenal. So the presence of epinephrine or metanephrine in general suggests pheochromocytoma. However, a pheochromocytoma that is not adrenergic and that is noradrenergic or dopaminergic suggests the presence of a VHL or SDHX mutation. Thoracoabdominal paragangliomas typically produce norepinephrine and or dopamine and not epinephrine. SDHX mutations account for most of this group. And a tumor that is adrenergic is not likely to be in the thorax or abdomen outside of the adrenal, with the exception of the Chinese group that I, that I mentioned earlier. Most head and neck paragangliomas lack tyrosine hydroxylase and are therefore actually unable to synthesize any catecholamines. And they may, in fact, also lack other markers that are classically associated with paragangliomas, including a tyrosine hydroxylase and chromogranin A. And to diagnose some of these tumors correctly, we may have to resort to newer, newer markers, uh, including transcription factors, INSM1 and, and uh, GATA3. Uh, but it all should also be remembered that up to 35% of the head and neck tumors that appear non-functional on clinical assays actually show tyrosine hydroxylase expression by uh, immunohistochemistry and that can be diagnostically useful in some cases. I mentioned the epinephrine producing paragangliomas in China. Most of these appear to be associated with somatic HRAS and FGFR1 mutations. And this is a story that is just beginning to develop. The Cancer Genome Atlas study of 2017 divided pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas into genotype-phenotype clusters based on transcriptome germline mutation and expression of selected proteomic markers. And the major clusters at that time were called cluster one, two and cluster one. So our canonical hereditary tumors, those caused by RET and NF1, fit into cluster two, which is characterized initially by, 
by abnormalities of kinase signaling. RET being a receptor tyrosine kinase activated by ligands of the GDNF family and NF1 being a tumor suppressor gene that interferes or that, that, uh, that, that counteracts uh, kinase signaling through the MAP kinase cascade. Cluster 1 is now known as this, the pseudo-hypoxic cluster and both VHL and SD, SDHX tumors fall into cluster 1, pseudo-hypoxia. The third relatively rare cluster is a Wnt-altered a cluster uh, in, in which the major mutations are fusions of, of, of genes of the mammal family, which is a developmentally regulated gene. If you look at the frequencies of germline and somatic mutations in these three clusters, the Wnt-altered tumors are all somatic, Cluster two is a more or less equal mixture of germline and somatic mutations with a predominance of somatic mutations because of the great abundance of somatic NF1 mutations. And cluster one, the pseudohypoxic cluster, is predominant in germline. Molecular clusters are important because they may lead to highly selective targeted therapies. And we can understand some of these targets by looking at how cells regulate responses to oxygen. So in a normal cell, in the presence of normal O2 concentration, enzymes that are called proleal hydroxylase domain enzymes, or PhD enzymes, hypoxylate, uh, hy hydroxylate hypoxy inducible transcription factors such as if uh, if 2a or or if one on uh, on proleal domains and this this uh, hydroxylation tags them to be targeted by the von hippel lindau protein for proteolytic degradation under physiological hypoxic conditions, the reverse happens. The proleal hydroxylase domain proteins show reduced activity. HIF proteins are not hydroxylated, therefore not degraded, and they remain bound to domains in, in the DNA that cause, uh, that cause activation of a variety of oxygen-sensitive genes. In pseudo-hypoxic tumors, those, activate, those associated with VHL or, or, or HIF-2A mutations and some others, we have hypoxic signaling in the presence of normal or elevated oxygen conditions. And this occurs because the PhD proteins are members of a large family of proteins called 2-oxyglutarate-dependent dioxygenases, alpha-ketoglutarate-dependent dioxygenases would be a different term, <coughs> that use 2-oxyglutarate as a co-substrate and generate succinate as a byproduct. So in the presence of elevated succinate, for example, which occurs in all of the tumors with SDHX mutations, these uh, two oxoglutarate dependent dioxygenases are inhibited by the presence of excess succinate. And HIF2 alpha, HIF hypoxia inducible transcription factors are not degraded and they remain within the nucleus abnormally. Uh, in the presence of high oxygen as well as as they would with low oxygen. But the exact mechanisms of tumorigenesis with VHL and, and SDH mutations are quite different because in VHL, it is the VHL protein itself that's, that's defective. So it's a rather late stage in the degradation of these, of these, of these factors. 
But in the case of the SDH mutated tumors, there are additional effects of the accumulated succinate. And the additional features of the SDH defi deficient tumors include a hypermethylator phenotype because the two oxyglutarate dependent dioxygenase family includes enzymes besides the, the, the proleal hydroxylases, including enzymes, succinate sensitive enzymes that demethylate histones and, and, D, and DNA. And, and, uh, and DNA. So you have a variety of abnormalities resulting from hypermethylation uh, that in, in the SDH deficient tumor, tumors that you do not see in the VHL deficient tumors. In addition, you also have metabolic rewiring resulting from succinate deficiency. Uh, causing alternate uh, utilization of, of biosynthetic pathways, anaplerotic pathways that branch off the Krebs cycle, and uh, perhaps bioenergetic imbalance uh, resulting from the shift to aerobic glycolysis. The roles of pathology and biomarkers in the field of pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas has, have also expanded. We have a classic role of differential diagnosis, we now have increasing responsibilities in identifying patients who may have familial disease. We have some possibilities of assessing metastatic potential. At this point, our role may be confirmed mostly to histologic confirmation of metastases, but there may also be some predictive tests in the wings. Uh, and in addition, there are predictive markers for imaging and treatment. For differential diagnosis, we know there are many, in addition to the classic cell ballin pattern, there are many patterns without cell ballin involving cells of different sizes and different cytologic features. And the differential diagnosis is, is huge, and it in can include epithelial and non-epithelial carcinomas, uh, especially confusingly, it may include epithelial neuroendocrine neoplasms. Our general approach is immuno an immunohistochemical panel to show neuroendocrine markers such as chromogranin A or synaptophysin, combined with the absence of keratins to rule out epithelial nets and the presence of functional markers and transcription factors such as GATA3 as, as needed. A caveat is that head and neck paragangliomas can be non-functional and also uh, negative or only focally positive for other uh, classic protein markers, as in this tumor, which is completely negative for tyrosine hydroxylase. And in those tumors in particular, transcription factors and panels of markers can be critically important to avoid uh, mistakes with serious diagnostic consequences. For identifying familial disease, there are especially new challenges for clinicians and pathologists because syndromes overlap and include new components such as SDH deficient GIST, renal cell carcinoma, and pituitary tumors. And in addition, some hereditary pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas are not syndromic. For example, those that come caused by hereditary mutations of TMEM-127, SDHA, or KIF-1B are usually solitary tumors uh, without a, a, other uh, accompanying manifestations. In addition, transmission of some hereditary pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas are subject to inheritance resembling maternal imprinting. So that paragangliomas caused by SDHD or SDHAF2 mutations can be transmitted in terms of susceptibility by either the mother or the father, but the disease becomes penetrant only as a rule, only if transmitted by the father. As a consequence, whole generations of patients with hereditary susceptibility to these tumors 
can be missed, and that is the reason that it took so long for SDHD mutation to be identified as a common cause of uh, hereditary head and neck paragangliomas. So the warnings to us here are to be aware of the new hereditary landscape, to consider genetic testing for all patients with pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, and to be alert to possible syndromically associated tumors and their distinctive characteristics. So findings suggestive of classical familial disease are multiple tumors and tumors combined with diffuse or diffuse and nodular hyperplasia. We no longer call nodular and disease in the adrenal medulla nodular hyperplasia because all of these two nodules have the molecular hallmarks of, of microphiochromocytomas. In addition, familial disease in general tends to occur in young patients, to be multiple or bilateral, to have other syndrome-associated tumors, and to have, in some cases, to have distinctive immunohistochemical markers. Additional findings, however, are that uh, not, these not diffuse, multi, multiple tumors in the adrenal are not always, are almost always pre characteristic of MEN2, but even in MEN2 are not always present, usually not present in other syndromes, often not concurrent, and can be subtle. So there's no question about the multiple tumors in this adrenal, but in this adrenal, the presence of these small nodules was quite subtle, and this can be missed in less than a Sorry, we'll be cutting this uh, talk short as the, the we need the experts will cannot be delayed as that is live. This will be played later.